Uh, my name is Shelby Ochoa. I'm a special education teacher. Um, I work at Esther B. Clark, which is a school within CHC. Uh, we specialize in kids uh, with emotional and behavioral disorders. And um, our goal is to give them the skills necessary to transition back to public school. So that's kind of uh, where I'm coming from. And I'm her partner in crime this evening. Uh, I'm Brandon Carlton, uh, behaviorist and student support counselor at uh, Esther B. Clark School South Bay. Uh, so we both work down in San Jose. Uh, both started up here in Palo Alto, and we're here to help you guys out tonight. Uh, I think what we're going to do, like, if there's any time we're moving too fast or going through things, we kind of like to have, like, a workshop-type format. Um, so feel free to stick a hand in the air, ask questions. Hey, Brandon, can you slow down? Can you repeat that? Hey, Michelle, Shelby, can we talk about that concept for a second? And just... Uh, We'll balance out, like making sure that you guys' needs needs are met, but then keeping the content moving forward. So, yes. so Brandon and I have had kind of the unique experience of we both started working here at our Palo Alto campus. Um, our Esther B. Clark's located up there, uh, the second story. Hello. Uh, and last year we opened up a second campus, so we went from being a very established school with lots of regulations <laughs> and rules, and people have worked there for years, and then we kind of just went over to South Bay and started our own campus uh, and it was it's a whole new experience you know it's there's no upstairs it's just kind of a it's a public school setting almost that we're renting out um, and we kind of had to like roll with the punches and figure everything out as we went so that really I think hardened us <laughs> as a collective it's, it's an group. adventure you know for sure yeah. I, mean, I mean you know yeah we were familiar with uh, having to deal with some behavioral uh, di challenges or difficulties in a very controlled environment and then when it's like a public school like I'm sure a lot of you guys work at that's like not a very controlled environment so uh, mm -hmm. we're here to try to help you guys out tonight we will start off with um, understanding the function of the behavior, um, and then we will go into self-control planning, and then how, as teachers, you can create an environment uh, to promote the positive behavior, and then how we can foster those positive behaviors. Uh, and then we'll finish up with proactive and reactive strategies. Okay, so we have a do now, which is what we call the warm-ups. Um, I would like everyone to think of one particular student in their class that maybe has some uh, behavior that you find challenging, and try and make it one that's like challenging for you to like run the whole class, not just like for you like to interact with that student, but it, they like stop the class with this behavior. Um, I think it'll be more beneficial if we think of just one specific student instead of uh, working with you know, like thinking of your whole class, um, and then, because that can be kind of overwhelming to try and think of all of your students. So let's just kind of focus on one, and then as we go through the presentation, we'll like ask you to like reference back to that student. Just to uh, get kind of the vibe of the room. So at Esther B. Clark, we work in teams, right? So there's always the lead teacher who, uh, like runs and organizes the room and then they are supported by a classroom behaviorist and then there's always a classroom assistant so there's always at least three adults in the room and then some kids have one-to-one -one aides which will add adults so it comes very naturally to us to like think of like oh well if you're busy have your assistant do it um but i was just wondering is anyone like alone in the room doesn't have anyone okay so that's good and so it seems it seems kind of like 50 50 and the rest of you guys work within teams um, okay, okay, that's good to know. That's good. Uh, okay, so does um, we're going to be discussing their behaviors. Does anyone want to share? Do they think they have a good behavior to share with the class that stops everything? Um, well, one of my students, whenever things kind of don't go, he's on the spectrum, so whenever things don't go the way that he has in mind, he will scream at the top of his lungs uh, really loud. No, Miss Tiffany, <laughs> and like the whole class stops and looks. Yeah. Um, and it'll be different things throughout, which will, which will trigger that. But it's a pretty common behavior. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Screaming's classic. It's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have one they want to share with the group, Christian? Yes. Uh, so I have a student that when he gets a certain level, like flip desks or try to throw things at my head. And then, yeah, that's like on the extreme end, but he'll like complain a lot, throw stuff. All the other kids will kind of copy him and complain and go in. And then, you know, it's just a lot of, yeah, just escalates a lot. From there. That sounds disruptive. That sounds very yeah, disruptive. disruptive. <laughs> that would be hard to be teaching a class. Yes. 
Um, I have one student who likes to yell out, let's do meth whenever it's math class. <laughs> why? <laughs> like, why are you doing every day? <laughs> he has no idea why it's unexpected either. <laughs> <laughs> every, it's the same conversation every day, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I used to have a student who would break the pencil when it was time to use it and then be like, how do you expect me to work? I don't have a pencil. That was my first year of teaching and it was, <laughs> it was a rough one to deal with. <laughs> um, one of my students in eighth grader is diagnosed with oppositional disorder and she um, is very bright. And, and whenever we have a guest speaker, we have one guest coming in, she will ask the most inappropriate and embarrassing questions you could imagine. Yeah. You know? And then everything stops for a minute. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited. I mean, this is fun. This is fun. I like. <laughs> I like having chaos and putting it into order. I think that's a teacher trait, but <laughs> that's something that like brings me happiness. So. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I I get it. I mean, we're all kind of like we're all here for the same purpose, doing the same things, right? You know. So why does the student engage in this behavior? Um, we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to really focus on the first. These are the functions of behavior overview. We're really going to focus on the first three tonight. Um, attention seeking, escape function, and tangible access function, uh, sensory stimulus function, um, and the pain and attenu attenuation function are something that you see in more typical and really low functioning kids on the spectrum. Um, the more kids that are higher functioning or that we see with these, you know, like you mentioned an ODD kid or things like that, we see these type of the first three functions more prevalent. Um, I love the screaming one because as soon as you mentioned the screaming went to me. I was like, oh, there's tension seeking behavior right there. So um, some of these are, it may seem pretty self-explanatory, and then some of these swing to the other side where they're kind of like clear as mud, right? And so it's like, Brandon, let's talk about the difference between these things, all right? Um, so the first one, let's go over real quickly, is the attention, attention seeking behavior. Let's just get right into it. Uh, student engage in problematic behavior to gain someone's attention. Like, so there's some pretty good markers on that example you gave. We're yelling your name. Telling you no, others, it happens when other students are talking or, or the classroom is like that. So you were looking for those kind of like, where do these, these behaviors occur the most? Does, are they occurring um, when there's a, only you, do the, do, if the problem behavior disappears 100%, when you're the only per person in the room with a kid, you can pretty much put the, you know, put the marker on, hey, this is probably an attention seeking behavior because there's nobody else's attention to compete for. Um, so uh, does a student see this if someone is watching? We're talking about stories, right? I had a student I was working with the other day. It was extremely escalated. Didn't like what was going on. And he goes, I'm leaving. And I went, OK, that's fine. And then he took three steps towards the door of campus and went, I'm still leaving. <laughs> OK, that's fine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here. OK. Just let you know, I'm still leaving. And I'm like, all right, yeah, I get it. I, so I walked in the room, and he followed me into the room. So you know, once he leaves campus, then all the attention that he was, you know, seeking is gone. So, you know, it was like to keep the argument going, to keep the escalation going, things like that. Um, we'll talk more about communication strategies um, later because the worst thing to do with an attention-seeking kid, and, and a task-avoiding kid, we'll talk about too, is to sit there and argue with them because direction is clear, concise, to the point, and moving on. Um, because as long as you are, we'll talk about it more later too, as long as you keep engaging that tension seeking behavior, you're actually reinforcing that negative outcome. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, does a problem behavior occur when the attention is on someone else? Lo big classroom, lots of stuff going on, happens a lot around the holiday times, you guys are doing group projects with kids or whatever, I don't know what's going on in your classrooms, you can use your imagination. But uh, you know, all this chaos going on and they're not getting the attention they need and there you go, you know. So you get a lot, you get those problem behaviors. Like, like I keep going back to that yelling out one. It's a classic example. So anybody else want to talk about, uh, anybody want to say anything about attention seeking behaviors they may be seeing in their classrooms? Yeah. So I have a student who um, could care less whether I'm paying attention to him, but wants the whole rest of the class, like all mm -hmm. of the peers, to be paying attention. And the, <laughs> the goal is often to like make crap a joke mm -hmm. or something that will get everyone else focused on him. Yeah. No, that's a good point because the attention seeking behavior isn't always us as the caregivers. The attention is being, you know, they want that peer attention too, so they're going to do anything they can. Um, one of the strategies we use at EBC, and it's really hard to do, is train all the other kids to ignore these behaviors. And that's like, I know it's like moving a mountain. Like, I think push, part in a, push starting a freight train is easier, but, you know, we'll figure it out. All right, um, let's move on real quick to escape and avoiding, okay? I, I like escape and avoiding. They're, they're pretty much the same, but then there's some other things that make them pretty different. 
um, and we can talk about those differences because uh, it can be pretty complex. This is one to me where the, no matter who I'm talking to or training about these type of things, uh, this is one of the kind of escape and avoiding that people seem to need the most help with, and that's, that's okay. Sometimes I have to really think critically, and I've been working for CHD for almost nine years, and I have to really think critically, is this an escape maintained behavior or is this an avoiding behavior? Um, the difference is the student engaging in problematic behavior to avoid instruction, demands, activities, or uh, you know, events or stimulus. So it's one of those things where uh, you know, the adverse stimulus. So if a kid, you have to really start to kind of slow down and really think about what these functions when these things happen. If a kid is continuing to argue with you about a direction you've given, that may seem like it's an attention seeking behavior, but at the same time, think, really start thinking about it critically. If they're willing to keep the argument going for 45 minutes, then they've just successfully avoided the whole class, right? So there you go. It, it gets a little tricky sometimes. Um, does the, uh, does the, the behavior persist when there's a, a demand or an, an instruction? Um, my favorite, I was working with a student for Shelby the other day, didn't like Miss Shelby at all, but only, likes, only doesn't like Miss Shelby at math class. Shelby's cool every other time, but not a math class, uh-uh. I actually, I got, all of a sudden, I'm like checking my email, and a student shared a Google Doc with me, and it's titled, I hate you. And I open it up, and I was like, this is, this might be fun. And it just says, like, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. But we were fine after math class. I think he just really didn't like the lesson that day. And I was like, that's kind of unexpected. Yeah. <laughs> what else to say? Then my conversation was like, hey, man, let's just talk about how you don't like math class. Not like, not like in Miss Shelby. You cool every other time. Yeah, math really stinks, Mr. C. Yeah, I know. It's okay. I don't like math either. <laughs> but, you know, those are those, those specific tasks and, and those specific you know, subjects and things like that. Um, so it can manifest itself in, a, in different ways, you know, being acting out, ha causing that argument, causing that uh, whatever they can do to avoid putting off that whatever it is um, that you're asking them to do. The escape function is more, to me, is more like when you get the school refusal. Um, I'm not going to come to school because I'm avoiding going to school altogether. Or if you notice, like, there's a student that uh, maybe there's something social going on on, on the playground, so they're deliberately doing something to get in trouble, like, right before lunchtime every day. And you start to notice that pattern, like, Oh, okay, little Johnny is like, you know, really starting to, you know, doesn't want to do this class, but he normally tells me he likes this class, but every day, right before, it, this class is before lunchtime, like, what's going on? They're, they're uh, uh, escaping that lunch period altogether. That's what they're trying to get to do. So um, it's, the avoiding is usually when there's a specific demand. Escape is usually something a little bit more cryptic for us to figure out. Um, the access to preferred tangibles. All right, I got to ask, how many, how many of you guys collect your kids' cell phones? Raise your hand if you collect your cell phones. I collect your cell phones. Don't feel bad about it. <laughs> okay, that's actually a surprisingly small number. Um, this is one of the, this is like the bane of my existence, man. A lot of kids nowadays don't want to give up those cell phones, those tech devices. They mean something so much to them, you know. And sometimes their parents will argue with you, like, "What happens if I need to go to hold my kid in an emergency?" It's like, well, the 45 adults that are on campus, I hope can contact you. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. So. Um, but th we have these problematic behaviors because they don't want to give up of that, that preferred tangible item. I'm not giving you up my phone. I'm not doing that for you. My parents said I could have it. I can have it. Um, so you may see the arguments. You may see the, the anger. Like uh, uh, I think this gentleman over here mentioned flipping desks over and things like that. Um, that can happen when you don't want to have give up preferred tangible. Um, you, say, you ever notice like they ask for a request and you say no? This, this is where there's some gray area in some of these functions. See, I like this because like... Somebody, like you say no to a kid, right? Hey, can I go to the bathroom? What? You just came back from recess. Yeah, well, I really have to go. I forgot. Well, but it's math class. If you go now, you're not going to be able to hear the instruction piece of it. Yeah, but I really need to go. Okay, you got like two minutes to come back. That's not enough time. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you, they're, okay, are you trying to avoid math class or is there something else going on here? Um, usually the, when you tell them no on something, it's because they're denied... Uh, access to a tangible after a request can I have the cookies can I have the can I have the snack time right now it was already snack time sorry we can't do that um, so tangibles can be any number of things and then it's up to us kind of assess those basic needs as caregivers and figure out how we're gonna solve the problem for them or with them um, can you clean off your desk or put your backpack in your locker um, again the summer had a situation where a kid like you ever had a kid that has to bring that toy from home <laughs> yeah raise your hand if that's happened could you, I was, I'll just tell, I was just talking to, yeah, today, right? And I was just talking to Shelby before we started this, like, could you imagine if this was like the 90s and kids were bringing like Furbies to school? <laughs> like, that'd be a nightmare, right? Hey, could you put away your Furby? No, Mr. C, I want to ask it questions. And then the Furby looks at you, yum, yum. You're like, oh my goodness. 
how am I going to manage? I got to talk to the Furby and the kid now. Like, what are we going to, you know, so, you know, kids can bring these things that they feel comfortable with, right? It's a, it's a coping strategy they've learned. I feel comfortable bringing this or I feel comfortable having this, so I'm going to cause a problem if you ask me to put it away. And it's us, our job as caregivers to kind of teach them, you know, how to manage their existence without some of these access, these tangibles they want. Um, yes, okay, so yeah, I'm just gonna prompt you guys to look back at your behavior that you wrote down um, on your half sheet, and then try and think like what would be a possible function, like why, what is the purpose that it is serving. Uh, once you're able to kind of identify possible functions, then that can kind of decide what path we're gonna take uh, to help minimize that behavior. Can it be more than one? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Usually there's like one. Or like, is that not very common? Uh, no, there can be more than one. Usually there's like one where it's like the biggest one that if you address it first, then it will really re minimize. Yeah. Like, for example, that, that's a good question. Like, I didn't want to come to school today, so there's the avoidant behavior, right? But I came to school because I brought this blanket with me. So then you have, you have two behave functions that you're working on. You're working on the escape maintain behavior, mm -hmm. and you're also working on the access to preferred tangibles. So there, the, again, it's, it's about identifying these functions so you know which uh, coping strategies to help them with. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're trying to, what we try to teach you at ABC is that what we call the functionally equivalent replacement behavior, right? So it's like, what behavior can we help you do that satisfies that same need as that function without actually having something that looks kind of unexpected in the public? If you see a kid head banging, um, that may be relieving some sort of pain. I mean, as, as adults and caregivers, we may see, oh, that might hurt, you know, but we know we're not in their heads, we're not in their brains, and they may be doing that to relieve pain and we don't understand that. And so we're having to just op observe, collect data, figure out, and try to work with the families and work with the child to figure out, is that actually happening? That's where you see some kids on the spectrum, maybe they'll be pushing, like putting pressure, you know? That could be either the last two, the sensory stimuli, where they're getting something from those pressure points in their body, or they're, they're actually causing that pain or to either cause pain to help them focus or reduce pain to help mm -hmm. them focus. It kind of goes both ways. Um, and the sense of the sensory stimuli, I think we all kind of understand, like, kids that have fidgets and they need that sensory input, they may like, that's what, they love that kinetic sand stuff, I don't like it, but they like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, th sorry about that. Those are the last two functions. Like I said, we kind of don't cover those as much because when we talk about um, kids that are typically in the mainstream setting, uh, we, the first three functions are usually the most prevalent functions we see. But we're open to, like, definitely at the end when we have, like, the question and answer section, um, if you have questions about that more specific, we'd be happy to address that in a little bit more detail. I'm the head math teacher, uh, so that's why we have so many math examples. Uh, but I do, I teach seventh, eighth grade math uh, first period, and I have one student who would come in and almost every day just put his head down on his desk and really crabby and kind of non-responsive. And um, at first we kind of thought like, oh, he doesn't like math. Like this is just because of math. Um, but after like kind of getting to know him a bit more as a student, um, we found out that A, he doesn't really eat breakfast, and B, his parents leave for work really early, so he hasn't gotten any adult attention. So he's kind of just like, that's him asking for adult attention by putting his head down. So now every morning we make sure he has breakfast. Uh, we have provided breakfast for him, and I allow him to like sit next to me during math period and just like kind of talk to him. And that's, he just like really needs that in his life, and like his math grade has come way up, and he's actually kind of good at math, but it it was like at first, you know, it was like you have to figure out what that, what the function is. Um, okay, so yes, let's do strategies to reduce the problem behavior. So the first thing it seems kind of like a basic teacher rule is you need to use intentional language. Um, just think about the way you say things. First of all, you don't ever want to sound, well, for the most part, you don't want to sound like you're like yelling at them or being super harsh with them, but you want to give them a direction in a sense that doesn't have any loopholes because children love loopholes, right? They will find one if there is one, and then they like feeling like they outsmarted the adult in the room, which sometimes that happens, right? And you kind of just have to be like, yep, <laughs> you bested me in that situation. Um, but so just being like, sit down in your chair now. Not like, do you want to sit down in your chair? Can you sit down in your chair, right? It's all about like, you need to be very mindful of the way you're coming off or, you know, pull out a book, it's SSR time. Not can you pull out a book, you know, cause then they'll be like, I don't know, can I? You know, like things like that. So just really think about, say things in a way that does not allow an out basically. Cause if there is an out, they'll find an out. And then it, you know, and then you're kind of having to backpedal, and you don't look super authoritative um, in that situation. <laughs> the open-ended question is a task avoiding kid's best friend. 
you know. Mm-hmm. So you give them that open-ended question, you know, hey man, I, you know, I, I think you know, I think you should sit in your chair now. Well, should I? <laughs> well, how many times do I do? Do I need to sit in my chair now? Mm-hmm. Can I do it in ten minutes? Can I do it later? No, we need to do it now. So, like you said, very clear, very concise directions. Um, yeah, that's my experience with it too. Mm-hmm. And I think um, just being like firm but fair I know that that's just kind of like classic saying but it's like so important to just like be firm like mean what you say like if you say you know do this otherwise this is the consequence like you have to do that consequence like don't ever just make like empty threats because they'll learn that right and then they'll learn that like you don't really mean what you say so say what you mean mean what you say um and then just give them clear directions because you're the adult one of my favorite sayings is if you engage in an argument with a child you've already lost Right. Like they're not an equal to you. They do not have any power in the situation. Like you have the power. Don't engage in a back and forth. Just tell them what you want them to do. What are some of those things that trigger you? <coughs> Nobody wants to start. I'll tell you what. I'll be honest. I'll start. Okay. One of my f- like favorite things that triggers me is when I'm talking with a kid and I get, the, I give a direction. Hey, can you please sit down? And I get whatever. And it's like, oh, man, because you know in your head, like, this kid just said whatever to me. They really mean something else, and I know what they mean, and I don't like it. <laughs> and they know you don't like it either. That's why they say whatever, you know. So um, that's something that I have to be very careful about. I know triggers me. I know it's something that, you know, that's just, that's one of the hot buttons. Anybody have something like that where you know it sent you from zero to 60 like that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm rolling. <laughs> Can you do the assignment? Ugh. Yeah. What else? So one of the kids, same same kid actually, but he'll be like, like right before we go into the academic thing here, then he'll be like, ah, boring, 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 boring. I'm just like, ah, you know. Like, <laughs> and, and you're going, I haven't even like, I, you, even I haven't even said what we're doing yet, you know. Yeah, so it's very important to know these triggers, okay? That's why it's okay to have them, by the way. Everybody's gonna have them. I, I tell you what right now, if you tell me you have trigger you don't have triggers, I'm gonna call you a liar. Okay, <laughs> nobody's that good. I've worked here eight years and I still have things that send me to orbit right away. I know it, okay, it happens, okay. Um, access to your own coping strategies. So one thing I like to do is I like to do call what's called a self-control plan. Know what triggers you and know your response to it. So I'll be honest with you, when I went through things and I start like analyzing whether I have fight or flight responses. It was very eye-opening because I don't have any flight responses whatsoever. I go into all fight mode. I get the tunnel vision, and it's like, okay, we're gonna go through the eye of the storm together, I guess, you know? <laughs> and I gotta keep that really regulated. I gotta watch that because it is my job as the, the professional to handle the situation in a professional manner. So identifying those str- triggers, what are your coping strategies? I like my self-control plan. You guys notice that things happen to you physiologically when you get triggered? What happens to you physiologically when you get triggered? Tensing, sweating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all those things. Yeah, I, I definitely notice I get a little tunnel vision, and I start to kind of like, I start to kind of get this like you know, professional smile on my face. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I guess we're doing this, huh? You know, I kind of get get a little on my toes, you know, get bouncy, you know. It's like okay. So, but those are all important things to know because if you can identify what makes you, you know get into that mode, you can start combating it a little bit. And you can start understanding, okay, this is what I need to do. So one of my favorite things to do is I start to rub my fingers together and it kind of grounds me a little bit when I'm in this situation. Something I'm doing very simple that's like letting me know I'm okay. I'm grounding myself. Plus, I like to, I like to do a lot of backpacking. I like to do a lot of hiking, okay, when I was younger. Not, not so much anymore, but I will eventually. I'll get back into it, I promise. <laughs> and uh, But one of my favorite things was I would take myself to that space in my mind for just a split second where I'd be at the end of the day's hike and it'd be just nothing but the forest and the sounds of the forest and the crackle of my campfire and it was the most peaceful thing that I remember from my childhood. And so in that moment, kid is being, you know, having a behavior that you're obviously not happy with and how do you control yourself? Just taking that moment, grounding myself, thinking of that moment, taking a deep breath. I'm the professional, I'm here to help this situation, not add to it. You know, whatever fuel you put onto that fire, they're gonna respond with. So that's part about de-escalating that situation. Um, so that's a coping strategy and self-care. Keep a calm demeanor when you're stressful, it's really hard. Those of you that have the benefit of working with a team, it's okay to switch out with team members if you have to. There's nothing wrong with that. There's certain, I've noticed that not only certain behaviors trigger me, but sometimes there's certain kids that you, you love them to death, but when they have an escalated behavior, it just gets under your skin. And luckily, those of you that have team members, utilize those team members. I'm honest with my team members about it. Hey, I like this kid, but when I hit a certain point, I need you to switch out with me. And that's totally okay. That's how you protect not only yourself, but you're protecting that kid from an interaction. You're still building that relationship. You're building that rapport with them. Um, any questions about any of that? How you guys feel about that? Pretty cool, yeah? 
anybody have any like strategies they use already that, that they may not be aware of or they want to share? I mean, I, I, I regret five-year-olds, but they'll like hit and scream. Like those mm -hmm. things are more when I get through, but they're like hurting me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to kill you. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that's why. Um, but um, I think taking deep breaths or like sometimes I'll close my eyes and just take a deep breath to kind of not. So I can remove myself from the situation too and not give in to like the anger because if I have to physically remove the kid, I don't want to remove them out of anger right. out of force. Um, right. So I think that really helps me to calm down. And then I tell them. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and you're leading by example when you do those type of things, and it's really cool. You know, some of the, just be mindful of uh, a good self control plan or a good self care plan to access good coping strategies in a stressful situation will help you maintain the peace in the situation until you can exit it. Like, uh, a, not a very good strategy is like if your first step is, like, I'm going to take a break and leave the room, because sometimes we don't have that option. Sometimes we have to deal with the challenging behavior until either A, someone can switch out with us, or the challenge behavior is reduced. So just be mindful of that. Like when you're coming up with the good coping strategies and things you have to do, try to come up with things that can help you stay in the situation, but also keep yourself calm. It's, 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 it's challenging. I don't have a magic wand to help you guys do it, but it is challenging. Yes? One thing I, I struggle with, and it does come up, it does come up when I'm sort of managing me as well as the, the rest of the situation is, how am, I how am I going to respond or help us all whatever the scenario is to and a behavioral issue. Uh, I, I want to make sure that I'm not rewarding their behavior, but I might need to de-escalate sort of their their attitude, their behavior, or their energy, you know, and just really just really go to blue as fast as possible. And so if it's, it's giving them the space to read that they've been really, really mean to another child or to me or to another teacher, that can be rewarding it. So while I'm trying to manage or like manage myself, my own self-care, I find myself thinking like, what would be the easiest thing for me right now? And then, I, then I'm then i suddenly also grappling with this other side of myself, which is, am I rewarding this behavior? Am I really helping the child manage this? And am I really bringing forth this, uh, this feeling of like, no, this is the way it needs to get done. And this is, this is what you need to do. There are no buts about it. This is you know, not a conversation. Right. So that's where I kind of get into like a sticky place. Right. And that's a very, that's, that's actually a very good example to bring up. You're only rewarding that behavior if, so let's say if a child is like, if he's being mean to another student and you separate those two and then you need, they need some time to calm down. Like think about like, to me there's a difference between like the behavior management piece and the crisis management piece, right? So if at their point where they're being so mean that you don't know if this might escalate into a physical altercation or not, the first objective is obviously separation, right? You don't want that, you don't want it to escalate even further. So then as long as there is a consequence that follows up later, then that's fine. I see that as being the perfect outcome because you're staying calm, you're removing yourself, you're removing mm -hmm. the two kids that may be in conflict and, th and having them stay calm. Think about if a kid is escalating and yelling and screaming at another kid, you're just gonna add more fuel to the fire if you're, if you're like, Johnny, you need to stop being mean to Steven and by the way, you're having consequences. <laughs> They're not, they may not be available to access that information at that point in time. The, the more escalated they get, the more their cognition goes down. So if it's, it's totally okay to be like, you know what, Johnny, you need to sit over there and just stay calm for five minutes. Hey, I need you to stay over here. Come on, I'm gonna go check in with this other student. I'm gonna come back in five minutes. As long as you can stay calm in five minutes, we'll talk about this when I come back. And that way you're taking care of yourself, you're giving everybody the space, and then you come back and say, hey, you know, that was really unexpected how you're treating another student, and unfortunately these consequences are gonna have to, be, have to happen because of that. So there's nothing wrong with taking that space in between. I'm hoping I'm hoping I kind of helped you with that situation a little bit. There's nothing wrong with taking that little bit of space to make sure that you get a positive result or try to have a positive result. Hmm. Yeah. Um, for lack of saying something totally wrong, I'll say that sometimes the behavior that's the hardest for me to cope with is um, the response of the parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The interaction with the parents afterwards if there's mm -hmm. not like a really good, if there's not really good rapport there already. Mm -hmm. To that question, or mm -hmm. let me get back to you about that. But just you know, the verbal punctuations to buy myself some time to process and come up with a better response. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because yeah. Kids will give you that too. And like, yeah. I need a minute. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know really, but, um, right. 
And if you take a minute, you're actually modeling that, you're, you know, for the parents, mm -hmm. but also, you know, for the students too, you're modeling that positive. That's what we want them to do, right? If they're, I'm really upset, I don't understand this. Well, why don't you take a minute, just calm down, you know? Mm -hmm. let's, just, let's just come back to it in a second here, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're modeling that behavior that you're trying to get them to do. That's, that's actually a functional coping strategy. That's like, if they're really frustrated and they keep doing it, you're giving that positive attention when you come back around. So. This is actually a good segue, because we're actually gonna talk a little bit more about these situations that you guys just brought up. Oh, look at that, you switched it. Um, yeah, so we are gonna, we, yeah, we're talking about the strategies. So you can always do the pre-MAC principle, uh, which is the first do this and then get that. So if they want a, a, a space to read in, you could say, I mean, think about like, do you want them to turn in like a worksheet first or did you want them to apologize? You know, like, oh, well, like first I need to do a conflict resolution and then you can go read, like that's okay. So I always say try and like give away as much control as you can to, to gain the ultimate control, right? So like if a student wants to listen to music, if I'm kind of annoyed with them, right, I wanna be like, no, you can't listen to music. I have that power over you and I'm <laughs> saying no, right? Like that's just how I am as a person. But then you have to think about it, like am I really, you know, like helping the situation? And is there anything that's gonna go wrong drastically if they listen to music right now? So I'll say like, okay, what I want, what I actually want you to do is to get started on this math worksheet. So if you do the first four problems and you're showing me that you can work, then you can use your music and then you can use it for the rest of the period, right? So they have to show you that they're willing to do just a little bit and then give them that control. If that's what they want and you can leverage it, always leverage it to your advantage. Um, there's lots of times where a kid will come up to me and just like ask me for some sort of like incentive or like can I go work outside or this and whenever they ask me for something that's like slightly unexpected I always like stop and think like it's probably okay but like is there anything I want them to do right now and I try and make all these like little tiny contracts like throughout the day like yes you can go outside you know but first I'm going to need you to do this and they're way more willing to work with you if they know that you're you're, you're good on that and you're going to follow through and you're going to give them what they want right. So in the end, it doesn't matter if they want to work outside, right? But what I want them to do is to like put their name on their paper, you know, and put their notebook away, right? Because I need the room clean. Yeah. So little things like that. No, absolutely. And that's the, the pre-MAC principle works really well with those students we're talking about that doing the task avoiding behaviors. I don't like to do math. I don't want to do math. I just want to go hang out on the playground, okay? I don't, I'm not going to listen to anything you say. And then they're going to get upset if you're the one that's holding the, the consequences, right? Well, if you don't do this, then you're going to have some consequences. I'd like you to avoid that. I tell you what, you know, put the, I've done this lots of times with youngsters. Put the math sheet worksheet down in front of them and say, you know what? As long as you try, here, let's draw a line right here. You do these five math problems, I'll even help you with them. So if you do these fa fa five math problems first, then we'll go outside and play. And so you're eventually then you can, if you do that enough, that's re that repetition of that skill, eventually you've built up the whole worksheet or the packet or whatever, and then, mm -hmm. then you can back off and it's like, well, instead of spending 20 minutes inside the math class, we're actually doing all 50 minutes inside the math class. And so that's where the pre-MAC principle comes in and kind of shines. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I lost my train of thought. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Are there any questions on the pre-MAC principle? I feel like pretty clear. Okay. Um, okay, so the positive reinforcement. So this is something that you like, act, well, at least I really had to actively work on uh, when I first started teaching because it's so easy to catch them doing something bad because they're so obvious about it and they do it so often, right? So it's so easy to be like, stop doing that, stop doing that, boring, like, stop boring, doing boring, that. Boring, 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 boring. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, it's like, stop, stop, stop. But that's, I mean, just so much negativity, then they don't trust you and then they go home and they tell their parents, like, you know, they're nothing but mean to me and they're picking on me and then the parents will come and be like, well, are you sure you don't pick on them? And it's like, do you know your child, dude? <laughs> like, um, so you have to just try and like catch them doing something good. So, I mean, my favorite one is like, oh, like I use this a lot with when I'm talking to parents. Like, hey, like your child like walked into the room very nicely. He picked up a chair and threw it across the room. But do you know what? Two hours later, he picked that chair up and he set it back down. <laughs> You know, like, and that, and I'm really proud of him for turning it around. And you always end on something you're proud of them for doing, even if it's just, like, the littlest, tiniest thing. And you really, 
you just have to like kind of get in the routine and you just start telling them all the time like oh my gosh like you sharpened your pencil so well and you sound you feel like you sound kind of <laughs> dumb and cheesy but it just creates more positive interactions and you want to have more positive than negative interactions because the uh, this is something I've like actively worked on and I went from like my first year of teaching when parents would be like are you sure you're not picking on my child to now like the most common feedback is like my kid always says, like, you never react with anger. Like, you know, and you deal with really tough situations, and you don't ever get angry. And it's like, well, that's not true. I get very angry. <laughs> like, but yeah. they don't – it's funny because the kids don't see it anymore. They All they see is, like, wow, that other kid was being super rude to the teacher, and she just – she remained calm. And then you kind of get the respect a little bit more when you're able to do that. One of my favorite examples of this is, like, oh, Mr. C, I didn't want to be here today. Yeah, but you're here, dog. I'm proud of you. That's yeah. great. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to be here, but you're still here. We'll get through it together, man. You know. Mm -hmm. My other favorite one is you ever have that student that gets really mad at you and they're walking through the hallway and they just don't want to talk to you, mm -hmm. and then they're just like, and then you walk up, and, hey man, you need anything? And they just ignore you. <laughs> My favorite thing is like, I, I was looking, hey, good talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I keep walking, you know. So it always makes other kids in the hallway laugh too, but it can, sometimes it breaks them out of it, sometimes it doesn't. Who knows? Sometimes, but. Mm -hmm. You kind of just have to let everything roll off your shoulder because in the end, like, nothing they say to you, like, really matters. You, I mean, you know, like, they, you know, the kids are so mean and they've said the most personal mean things to me and that, like, I would have to, like, leave the room and lay down with our therapy dog to just, like, decompress <laughs> from what this child just said to me. But in the end, it's like, why do I care? You know, like, they're 12. Like, they don't know how mean they're being. They're just trying to get a reaction out of you and they got it and therefore they're winning. Um, so just, yeah, you, you kind of have to do that when it's like, <laughs> one of my favorite stories is we have our, uh, our principal, Chris Harris, and one time there was this kid who was just like very, very escalated, and Chris Harris just happened to be like walking around the corner and had no idea what was happening, and the kid just goes, and fuck you, Mr. Harris, <laughs> and he was just like, okay, and just like keeps walking, you know, and you just, that's just kind of how you have to react in the situation, <laughs> like, I don't, and I'm just okay. going to stand there, like, I don't know what, he wasn't, he wasn't here all day, I don't know why he chose to, like, yell at the principal, like, yeah, he's been in his office, man, like, <laughs> you should be mad at me, I yeah. Don't know. <laughs> yeah, and the other kids really start to pick up on that, um, and yeah, this, like, catching them doing something good, it kind of rolls over into your personal life, too, so, like, all, like, thank my friends for transitioning into my house very nicely. <laughs> like, it just, you just start to be that way as a human being. Um, and then I have to turn off the teacher voice. <laughs> um, okay. Ooh, environmental controls. Okay, these are my favorite. I love having a controlled environment because the students I specifically work with are just chaotic. They're just chaos. And if you don't know exactly what you want them to do, they will like run that room. So as the lead teacher, you have to know exactly what you want in every moment. And it's kind of exhausting, right? Like at first it's like, I don't know, do whatever you want. Like, can you go outside for five minutes? Like, does that really matter right now? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what's best. Um, but n you just have to think like, no, I want everyone in the room for at least 40 out of the 50 minutes. So you can go outside for the last five minutes. And even if like it really doesn't matter and that student really could go outside on that break, you just have to like set that firm boundary of like, dude, I get it. Like you could go outside right now, but I'm sorry, it's only happening in the last 10 minutes of the period. And you kind of have to like have that empathy like, dude, like that sucks, I know, but this is how it is. And like, don't show them that there's any wiggle room because then they won't think that there is any wiggle room. When in reality, there's a lot of wiggle room, right? Everything that goes on in the classroom, like you've decided, it goes on. You don't always know that you want it to happen, right? Um, so if I found out that like, if I'm kind of unsure with what I want to be happening, then my other staff members get even more unsure. And then by the time it reaches the students, it's, ju it's just chaos, right? Um, so you always, always just say the expectation, write them on the board every day, um, have a visual schedule. I love my visual schedule. It's always posted in the exact same place in the room. Um, my assistant knows to switch it out each day, right? So at every moment of the school day, each one of my staff members knows exactly what they should be doing. And then that helps uh, the classroom run smoother, right? So whenever we have visitors or any, like another teacher comes to visit my class, they're always just like wow that no one's just sitting around right there's no one who has no idea what they should be doing right everyone knows what they should be doing and that 
comes from the teacher because you're the one who runs the room. So you really, really have to just kind of be a control freak, but also show them that you're fun so that they like you. <laughs> um, you have to stick to the schedule, right? If you're making a lot of schedule changes, then the kids, you know, they have to learn to, they can trust the schedule. If you make a lot of changes, then they're, they're going to be like, I don't, like, why would I look at that? Um, I like to also empower the students to take um, to take their own destiny and control. But so instead of them having to like ask a staff member like, what is next period or when is break? They can, they can uh, help themselves by looking at the schedule. So you always wanna push autonomy and have them help themselves as much as possible. And you can do that by clearly posting things in the room. Um, I work with kids who have, sorry have a lot of ADHD, right? So there's a lot of really cute posters and cute things I can put up on the wall, but the more things I have on the wall, the more things they get distracted by and it becomes overstimulating and it's kind of overwhelming. So I try and keep my room very neutral colored, right? All my folders, everything is like a calming blue. Um, <laughs> everyone kind of makes fun of me when it's time to put in our supply orders, but I'm very specific. All of our timers are one color, but it's very, just like the more orderly you can make the environment, um, the more calm the kids will get. If there's just like, I mean also, for I, I do teach older. I teach seventh and eighth grade, so I can do this. I know if you're younger, you do have like brightly colored things, um, but I would never, I would never put up like a neon pink sign in my room, right? <laughs> or like a red thing. <laughs> like everything has to be calming and orderly and that's just kind of who I am as a person. Um, also, this one I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, but your, your seating chart needs to be very intentional. I like to take the students who maybe are really good at peer modeling student ready behavior with the students who like need that peer model right, and then pairing them up. So one is kind of setting the example, and then one can watch. Also, you know, if you put two friends together and they really like to talk to each other, I mean, you're setting them up for a huge struggle throughout the day. Like, of course, they're gonna wanna talk to each other. If I sat next to my best friend, I'd be so tempted to talk to her, and I probably would start talking to her, right? I did it. <laughs> so yeah, and if you same thing with if you have two kids with a conflict, like don't put them right in front, like front and back, because then they'll constantly be turning around and arguing and bickering, right? So it's every time I switch the seating chart, it is like the whole team is in the room and we have like the most like in-depth discussions and like all these hypotheticals. And then I mean it's like it's like a math problem, yeah. like a very intense math problem. No, it is, but a little a little careful thought can go a long way. I mean, how many of you guys you have I I know we've all probably had that student and you brought up a really good example. That's why I was I just bounced popped in my head. That kid who's always turned around and gotta, you know, talk with engage the other kid. Whether that's you know, they start a conflict or even if they're being friendly, whatever the reason is behind it, it could be, you know, like the function could be that task avoidance or, you know, that attention seeking behavior. Who's had that student where you feel like you're looking at the back of their head all day long? I know I've had that student, right? And so how I typically try to solve it, it's like it's, a, it's kind of a difficult balancing act. And we, unfortunately with us, we have the teams as a behaviorist. I was a behaviorist here for a long time. So I would always tell a teacher, what's your first response? They need the academic help, but they're always turning around. Okay, I want them right in the front so I can help them all the time. My response was, I'll tell you what, I'll stand by right next to them and I'll help them and I'll put them at the very back. And they were like, why do you put them at the very back? Because at least they'll be facing you all day long. <laughs> <laughs> if they're yelling at another kid that's in the front row, they're seeing right past that kid, they can see the board still. Mm -hmm. And I can coach them to do that much easier. Hey man, I understand that you don't like that right now, but what should you be really focused on? Let's do that instead, okay? I'll tell you what, we can go talk about that later. Oh, okay, cool. So taking those little baby steps to help those, that classroom management, the seating chart, that's like one of them. So you can get creative with it, make it your own. You know, that kind of stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have my one student who needs like the most feedback. He has like the most severe ADHD and parents don't think medication will help. So that's just the situation. But like we used to put him in the front corner, like right here. So my behaviorist, his desk is here and then I would be teaching. And so he is surrounded by two, um, two staff members at all times. But our room or our door is in the very back of the room. So every time he had to like get up to go to the bathroom or and whenever he came to school, he would get a walk by every single student and he would just like play with the things on their desk and like pick up their pencil you know and, it, and we're just giving him that opportunity because he I mean there's no way he can't not walk by all of those desks so what we did is we took his desk and we took him out of the group and he is now like m my desk is here and then his desk is right next to my desk and it's facing me but it's behind all the other students so not only do I get to help him whenever he needs the help 
he has no reason to walk by any desk ever. He doesn't even go in the group. And it's actually, it's been working out well. I sent a picture to his mother. She thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Luckily, we have a good relationship. But I was like, look what we had to do to your son. And she was like, yes, I know. Because, <laughs> I mean, you, you may have second thoughts about some stuff like that where it's like, oh, are we stunting that social opportunity like during class? It's like, believe me, we'll stunt that. You, you'll have plenty of time to make up that social opportunity during recess if we foster this correctly. What we're doing is we're teaching that functionally equivalent behavior so they can access the learning material in class, right? So sometimes it's, it's okay to be creative and, and have those, you know, manage those different stimuluses and get them to where they can access that material. Mm -hmm. And again, timers for transitions. I mean, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with visual timers, but it just helps the kids. Like by the time that there's no more red left, you have to be at your seat. The five minute transition is for is not social time, right? It's for you to get your materials and be ready by the time it goes off. Um, and so that way they can't be like, I didn't know class was starting or I didn't know. It's like if you if you are not in your seat with all of your materials out and only those materials out, um, we give them what's called a score drop where they lose social time. So it's like you will be losing social time if you do not do this. Um, okay, so visual schedules. I think that not only is the daily schedule important, but even for routines that you do every day, you probably are gonna think that like, oh, eventually they'll pick it up. Like why would I have to post a schedule every single day? But these kids, I mean, it's not what they're interested in. It's not exciting for them, and so it's just not something they're gonna care to remember, and they're gonna take a little bit longer to remember, basically. So I really like my pack-up routine. My favorite schedule is my <laughs> desk check schedule. Um, and so I, and it's always short. It's always only four to five points, and it's like, there can be no loose papers in your desk. You can have one pencil and one pen. You need your calculator. We provide the calculators, and all my kids, kept losing the calculators, and we could not figure out where they're going. So we l labeled all the calculators with their initials and then Velcroed them to the top of their desks. And so now, <laughs> they will get in trouble if they do not have their calculator out and Velcroed to their desk. Um, that was like, <laughs> outsmarted all of you. <laughs> You're gonna lose them, I will stick them to your desk. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's, I, it's just like the little things like that, like the pack up routine, the morning routine, like that's posted on my front door. Um, just like things that are so obvious to you as an adult, like how could you forget to turn in your homework folder each morning? But to them, it, it's just, it doesn't come to their mind naturally. So, so help them out, set, it, set them up for success by giving them these things that they can do to help them. Um, any questions so far? I don't wanna move too fast, okay. Um, token economies, these are uh, pretty classic, I think, from credential programs. But th my advice would be make sure it's something that you can like feasibly do. Um, like, s Brandon, I know you like tickets. I like putting a uh, little... Love tickets. <laughs> I like to laminate things and put it on the desk and then use dry erase markers to give them um, like, like little t tally marks. But like sometimes there's things where you're like, oh, this is like I'll give out stickers or something. And once they get so many stickers, but then you, j you put the stickers in a drawer and you forget about them. And even though you promised the kids they'd earn things and they should be earning those things, you just kind of forget. So make sure it's something that like you can do naturally and you'll actually remember. Forgetting what they earn only goes so far. I figured that out the hard way. One time I did like a ticket system that I forgot to like tell them what they were rewarding. But I just like walk up to a kid's desk and drop like 20 tickets on his desk because he was doing a good job. And then their kids are like, oh, I want 20 tickets. How can I get those tickets too? Well, I gotta do the things that you're supposed to be doing. And it, it worked out really great until we got to the point where like, well, Mr. C, what are the tickets for? <laughs> I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, and I think also you have to get the kids buy-in. Like, I might think that like going to this one restaurant would be a really great incentive, or, or like earning a new bookshelf would be really cool, right? <laughs> but I don't know if the kids would think that's really cool. So it's definitely like ask them, have a conversation with them, like what, what do you want to earn? And then if it's something that you can you know, manage to get for them, um, that will get their buy-in a little bit more. Uh, this is an example, we call it Habits of Success, and it's a class-wide point system, right? So we set up like five uh, like specific like behaviors we wanna see, and it's like independence, like being proactive, kindness points. So there's these five specific things, and like the class like votes on it, right? But in reality, we're kind of like guiding that conversation to like the five ones that we want. Um, <laughs> and then we say like, 
And we try and make it kind of vague, like kindness points, right? So that could be a lot of behaviors. I used to say like very specific, like helping a peer with their work, but then it's like, oh, but like, also, like, I put away, like, these books for them. Like, do I get points for this? And it got, like, s where I had to, like, put so many different things. So if you just make it kind of a vague, nice term, like being proactive. Um, and then you can just kind of call that kid out in front of the class and say, like, hey, like, proactive points, great job. And then you just tally it up. And uh, we do it in every two weeks, uh, whatever works best for you, right? And you can uh, decide brainstorm with the kids about all the different things they want. For this class, one kid really wanted to go to the airport and like take a tour of the airport. Um, so we set that at 150 points, right? And that was like the big one. And then you, every two weeks, like you cash out and then you can like record how many points they've been earning. So you can see like, oh, like, you know, like this two weeks was really good. Like what happened during those two weeks that like we were able to be so successful? And then like what happened over here, you know, in February, like why was that challenging? Can you guys think about like what was challenging for that? And just kind of like processing, um, you know, their own behavior with them. And then that kind of helps them like reflect on things while also getting them excited to get these really cool prizes. I didn't know how the logistics of the airport was going to work, by the way. <laughs> I know, so you're probably thinking it. Uh, I'm say it, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually, like, food and parties is the easiest one. And that's, and that's always, like, a fun, like, team-building experience, just eating food together. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so the, we're kind of coming down to, you know, the, the third quarter of our, our slideshow here. It's like, why do uh, problem behaviors continue? Um, usually if a problematic behavior or challenging behavior continues, it's because it's being reinforced in some way. Travis had this a good question about like, oh, I did this and I want to make sure I'm not reinforcing a negative behavior, right? So this is, we're going to kind of get into some of the more of the meat and potatoes in that. Uh, if I start talking about it and you guys have a question, please throw your hand up. Uh, you know, feel free to, let's just kind of workshop it out, talk it. Because it kind of, it can be, you want to reinforce positive behaviors at the same time you want to discourage, you know, the negative behaviors or, or it was like to call them like the expected behaviors versus like, you know, discourage the unexpected behaviors. So, you know, let's go ahead and get into that. So problem behavior opportunities when somebody's reinforcing it. And a lot of times we're unknowingly reinforcing it. And that's that's OK. Sometimes we have to like analyze our own mistakes that we make and just not be, feel bad about it, but just move forward. We can always recuperate more later. OK, it's, there's no. Don't feel bad because all of a sudden you'd be like, oh, man, I've had students where I've like, oh, we're still having these problems and our behavior plan isn't working. And it's like, well, we've been, we've been, this kid really likes this and we've been unknowingly reinforcing this behavior for six months. It's like, okay, well, we better start figuring it out. Um, so um, we do this by responding physically, verbally, or making eye contact or following prompt behavior to gain attention. That's for the attendance-seeking kids. Uh, saying no but eventually giving in. You can always tell when a kid negotiates a lot at home. <laughs> That's one of my favorites, you know. And so sometimes when we're, we're going back to like the clear, clear directions part, you know, one of the things I can say is, hey, man, can you please, I would really like it. Can you sit in your seat, please? Well, I'm not really want to do that right now. Well, I know that. Well, can I sit over here? Well, no, I need you to sit right where we assign you to sit for right now. Just try it out. Okay, we'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, then we can move you later. But you got to try it out right now. Well, you know, I, there's things I really don't want to. Hey, I, guess what? I'm going to tell you something right now, okay? When I told you no the first time, that was not an opening offer. <laughs> okay, I know you may think that, and that's okay to think that right now, but I tell you what, if you sit down in your chair, you just need to do this, or else we're gonna have to move to having consequences. I'm trying to help you avoid that, so please, man, just sit down in your chair. Oh, okay, fine, I'll sit in my chair. So, I mean, if it goes that smooth, then you, then you know, like, they're used to that in negotiation. Some kids are more rigid than others. It doesn't always go as smooth. It's just a, you know, armchair example of uh, those type of things. Um, continuing to, abate and, uh, to debate, and engage in the power struggle, um, you know, negotiation and bribes. You always tell a kid get bribed at home too. Hey, you have any kids that get bribed at home? If you do this, I'll give you this, right? Well, what are you gonna give me if I do what you want me to do? Screen time. Oh my goodness, who thinks screen time is the bane of our existence right now? I know I do. You know, yes, the iPad is not a babysitter. I'm bummed out, bummed out about the iPads. I see them come to school. I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, yeah, it's difficult. We, uh, that, the thing about it, we have a lot of competition when it comes to that kind of stuff, okay? We, I, I promise you that we are not going to be more stimulating than, uh, than that iPad, and that's one of the hardest things. That's one of the hardest things to start to combat. But then you get, you know, that's where you get in the, private, the power struggle in the negotiation. I want this, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do what I want me to do, or I will do this if I get this. And it's like, no, well, if you don't follow the direction, then you're not going to get that for even longer. So I want, you, I want you to get your time. So that's the thing, lending them that, that thing, I want you to get that time. You probably don't really want them to have time. 
Let's be honest, right? You probably are like, you need to go ride a bike <laughs> instead of being on your iPad, right? But lending them that control, lending them that part of it, saying, hey, you know what? You get this, you get this time if you complete this. And I really want you to have that successfully. But you're not, I'm not really interested in allowing you to have that if you're not going to be successful at getting it. You have to earn it. There's a lot of things where, like, a lot of these things that we can avoid reinforcing their negative behaviors if we actually put it back on them to make the decision. I, I like to focus a lot on the language of you earn it. I'm not the one taking it away from you. You're earning it. You, through uh, One of the things is, like, I, I love it when they look at me and they go, you're just making me do this. Now, let's be honest. Can we make them do anything? <laughs> you can't make them do anything. Okay? As much as we'd love to make them do something, you can't make them do anything. They have to earn it. And that's one of the things is I always tell them is I'm not making you do anything. I'm just responding to the, your behaviors. So if you responded this way, I would have this reaction. But if you responded this way, I'm going to have this response. I think this is more expected, and I think you're capable of it. Therefore, I'm, I'm trying to guide you down this path. But if you want to do that, that's your choice, and I'll back off for now. Right? So, um, but we're not, that's the, some of the creative ways of not giving into that, not reinforcing, knowingly reinforce those behaviors, putting it back on them that they're earning whatever it is that they're, whether that's screen time, whether that's the, atten the positive attention, whether that's, uh, and then disengagement. If you have a kid that's attention seeking behavior and all they've, they've been reinforced all the time, like they have the argument with mom and dad for four hours, you get those emails where it's like, I argued with my kid for four hours last night. It was like, why'd you argue for four hours? That should be teaching you something. They're getting something out of arguing the four hours. I don't like arguing with the kid four hours. I'm not going to do it, you know. So, but it also teaches us that it's like, look, they're getting that attention-seeking behavior. They don't know how to get it positively, so they're going to get it negatively. And that's where coming back to, you know, what Shelby was saying about the communicating positively, finding finding the littlest things to do, you know, to teach them to praise them for, and it's something that kind of has that snowball effect. Um, that's why I start off with the kids when they're angry. Hey, man, good talk. That's all right. We'll talk about it later then. Okay. Tell me you're not happy. <laughs> not visual communication. You know, so, you know, but but putting it back on them. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to do this with you when you're ready. I'm ready to do this when when it's the right time for you. And so <laughs> so giving them a little bit, you're not losing anything. You can you have a two choices to make. You can either give them the time and space to figure it out and kind of calm down so they can reach baseline and they can actually work with you on the problem, or you can just butt your head against the wall all day long with them because you're not getting anything. It does you no good to get in that power struggle with them. Because it's, bottom line, at the end of the day, I like to call it like the emotional chess game, right? You're playing the emotional chess game all day long. Let's try to stay two steps ahead of them. Sometimes we can. Sometimes we can. Um, so these are just like some little tips. You know, all, obviously we want to avoid negotiation and bribes because if they're getting that at home, we don't want to do it to them here at school. You know, they know if, if mom and dad, if I work on them enough, they're just going to give in and give me the candy or they're going to give me, you know, whatever. That's a very basic, you know, example. But we want to make them earn it. We want, to, we want to do something different than what they're getting at home so we can help make them start making some changes to the behaviors. Any questions about any of that? <coughs> yeah. Uh, so I, we have a, just an example with a, a student right now where we're just when you're trying to figure out how to incentivize at school, mm -hmm. try to keep it at school, um, and it ended up kind of get, coming to a place where um, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our partnership with their, his parents, um, they said, well, we're just not going to get him. We'll, we'll let him know that he needs to be better in this class, and this is what better means, and he won't get any, he won't get any TV time. The kid comes back, had an amazing, amazing class. Um, the next day, it hasn't been consistent, but the thing that I wonder about is that they, the incentive is at home. The behaviors are at school, and that seems, that feels, dis for me as an educator, that feels disconnected, mm -hmm. even though we haven't still been able to find a successful incentive at school. So I'm kind of curious about how you feel about that, where the incentives are at home, or the reward is at home mm -hmm. and not at school when the behavior is happening at school. I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. Because if you think about what the long-term goal is, right, we're taking, we're, you, what you're doing right there is if you haven't come up with a successful incentive at school that that's been effective, but the one is working at home, then of course use it. It mm -hmm. has to be consistent though. It would have to be, I noticed you mentioned that consistency isn't there. Yeah. You know, the parents would have to be on board to make sure that that's gonna happen. If, if, they're, if they're doing well at school and they get that screen time at home, that has to be like, like clockwork. And if, even if he has a rough day where like maybe it's like one period, but they earn X amount of screen time, I would definitely break it up into sections. Like a complete full day looks like this amount of screen time. Half of, a full, half of the day looks like this amount of screen time. Don't make it all or nothing. Mm -hmm. But what, think about the skill that we're teaching them. As adults, we kind of take it for granted that we have gra delayed gratification all the time. 
right? What's our incentive for going to work being good professionals? We get a paycheck. We can't walk into our bosses and like, hey, I did really good today. Can I have a paycheck now? <laughs> no, you get it on Friday like everybody else. So come on. I had an awesome day, though. You just seen how I talked to that kid. It was great. No, sorry. So we're actually teaching them a life skill with that delayed gratification, and that's okay. So you just have to pay attention to whether it's working or not. If, if, if the incentive is not working, though, if, like, like, if it does feel too disconnected, maybe it's just a maturation curve. Maybe that's where the child is at. Maybe it's not where they're at. And so you have to start looking at other things. You, you're going to have a wide, there's such a wide, when you're reinforcing behaviors, there's such a wide range of kids. The kids that are extremely low functioning, it's like, write down one name, letter of your word for each M&M. &M. Okay, boom. And you're constantly reinforcing, constantly reinforcing. But we're hoping to move away from that to the reinforcers become less and less and more spread out over time. Because that's, as adults, we do that all the time. That's like, you know, the functionality of it. We don't just do it with paychecks, right? It's like we have weekend plans. We have all these different things. It's that delayed gratification that we know if we do what we're supposed to do as functional human beings, we get these things in our lives. They have no concept of that, but we're actually trying to teach them the same type of thing. Does that make sense? Right. I also think it's really awesome that the parents are like on board and willing to restrict screen time, right? Like, but there's so many parents who are like, it, you know, it's their. Ho I always try to remember, like, my home is like my sanctuary, right? And I love being home and shutting the door <laughs> and not having anyone else in my home. And like, imagine having like one of those children in your home all the time, like. That is chaotic. You know, can you relax when you have someone destroying your house? Like, not really. And that that's where they live. Um, and so lots of parents just aren't willing to, like, restrict any screen time or take anything away because they're like, I just need home to be as peaceful as possible, and putting them on an iPad is how to do that. And I kind of, I can understand, but then, of course, you know, that creates other issues. But the fact that the parents are on the same page as you and willing to help you out, I mean, I just think that that's, like, that's really fortunate. Yes. They have to be consistent yes. and on the same <laughs> and consistent on the same page. We recently had a, a, an issue, and it was it was like, what do we have to do about the situation? Okay, what's the situation? Okay, so we got a kid that lost screen time, and mom took away his Xbox, and dad said, "Wait a minute, it's right before Thanksgiving break. Yeah. He needs it." So what do we got to do in that? We have a lot of work to do with that. That's what we have, all right? <laughs> like, that's got to change right now. See what I mean? So it's like even parents not being on the same page consistency-wise with that can mess up the whole plan like that. So consistency is the key. Mom and dad have to be willing to follow through with the same consequence, and then they have to ma maintain that, con you know, that continuity. And it goes the other way, too. Even, even if, like, when it comes to there should be a next level to that, in my opinion, if they're when it comes time to up an expectation. Let's say we've lowered the expectation to be operationally defined as like they have a good day by coming in, like, you know, not flipping a desk over. But we may overlooking the swearing because the target behavior is like, we don't want them to flip the desk over, right? So once they've mastered that level of like not flipping the desk over, then we can transition to be like, hey, it's been a month. You've done really good at not flipping the desk over. So now we're gonna transition into swearing. Whether you're swearing at me or, or, or not directed at me or whatever, we just don't want you to swear anymore. So. Now your screen time is going to be dependent on this new, this new thing we're working on. So there always should be a progression. There should be a, a steps to it. And so, because a good incentive is something that you should eventually be able to fade off to where they can operate. You've taught them the functional skill, and they can operate without it. Now, screen time, we, I know I understand we live in like a very fast-paced, screen-oriented world these days. And so I think fading off the screen time would be teaching moderation, OK? If they're doing this functional level, you know, if they're it, then teaching that skill at like, if we've incentivized you with, a, with more screen time than we're comfortable with, we need to figure out a way of backing that off. That's the only like real pitfall that I could see there is like yeah. you know you don't want them to like say it's okay to come home and spend five hours of screen time or whatever it is. You know that's that's not healthy. But so good incentives like that should be consistent, healthy, and functional. Um, reinforcing alternative behavior. We've already kind of started talking to that about that. Um, you know behavior. What what are the problem behaviors that are exhibiting? What uh, problematic behaviors do, you have, do we want them or what positive behaviors do you want them to do instead? Uh, these positive behaviors that you want to emphasize and you want to reinforce. Now, this is where we can get into something tricky, and, and sometimes our own frustrations get the better of us. I'm a very big advocate of two things. Number one, if, you're gonna, if they're not going to earn something, you have to front load them all the time if they're not going to earn it if they do this behavior. Okay, you're starting to do this behavior. I just want to remind you that if you continue to do this behavior, then you're not going to you're not going to earn your incentive, and I I really want you to. Then if they continue to make that decision, that's fine. Now, here's the one. Here's a question I get all the time. You guys ready for this one? What if they earned it one time, but then they did the then they did the behavior like the hour an hour later? Never take away an incentive they've already earned. So that's another. That's the second thing that I'm really big on. 
if you promise them something and they've earned something and they, they've done the target, that's what people miss. Yes, the, the behavior that you're working on may be annoying. So for example, let's just take a, a general one, like swearing. So let's say you're on an hour to hour incentive plan. They get a token for every hour they don't swear at you, for example. So you get through first period, they don't swear at you. Man, Johnny did great, here's your token. Then you get like 10 minutes in the next period and you're like, ah, then they, they throw like an F-bomb out there, right? Oh, sorry, lost that token. Okay, that's one thing I want you to be very careful about doing because once they've earned that, they, they still did the behavior you wanted them to do that whole first hour. And sometimes we get really too quick to jump in there and say, you know what, you did the behavior, I don't want you to do so I'm gonna take it back, no. Just tell them, hey, you know what? You didn't earn it for this hour, maybe next time, and teach them that it's on that continuum. Like you're, that's, the, that's the most accurate way of reinforcing that behavior. If they do the behavior you want and you're reinforcing it, always reinforce it and never remove it. Yes? So, does it, does it okay, so this is like a very behavioral approach. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a couple of kids that we have where this is making me you know, have some ideas about what, what we might talk about. Absolutely. And I Mm -hmm. if, it really, if it really are things that are not able to control. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, what is, does that act, I mean, is that something that happens? Absolutely. And so it's worth, you, you go through the trying, and then the, the fact that it's not working is more information. Absolutely. So see what it meant. And sometimes, depending on what kind of behavior you're working with, um, a behavior plan may work, but you have to give it some time. Right. Now, like, there's something that, like, if you, if you put a behavior on extinction, for example, like, let's go back to the boring, 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 boring. I like that one, right? So if you train the whole class to ignore this and everybody ignores this behavior, what's going to happen? Wrong. He's going to go boring, 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 boring. See, that's what's called an extinction burst. Right? Oh, my goodness, it's not working, so I'm going to up the ante. Woo! Let's go for it. And so a lot of parents, that's where when you're working with parents, that's where they get really nervous about it because you tell them to do this plan, they expect that you just wave the magic wand like Disneyland and all of a sudden, boom, their kid's good. And then they call you up and be like, they gotten so much worse. I said, exactly. And I warned you about that it was going to happen because they're hoping that expectation will be backed off and you'll cave in and they'll get what they want. So that's where you have to be careful about those type of things. Sometimes a plan, you have to give it time. You come up with a plan and if you go, if, say if you go three, four weeks, it's not working. Okay, that's not incentivizing to them. They're not doing it. Not only, you're not going get, to always get the incentives right the first time. You're not always going to get their buy-in right the first time. So give the plan some time. If it works, sometimes they fall in place, they will start working right away. And you're like, hey, great, this is awesome. Sometimes you just need to kind of observe, collect a little data, figure it out. Sometimes you need to maybe, maybe make some minor adjustments to the plan. I would just be encouraging you like, to be careful about the duration in which you terminate a plan. You know, just don't say, don't give it, I've had students that, or teachers that I work with, it's like, it's been two days and it's not working. Well, of course not. We're trying to like reinforce 15 years of learned behavior here and have them change that. We're not gonna fix it in two days, you know? So just be very careful about that. So um, that was a good question. Um, and then, and then if, oh, sorry, yes. So you mentioned like that if it's like three to four weeks and it's not working, mm -hmm. then I'm just it. But how long would, would Sometimes you may notice a shift in your target behavior. Yeah. Let's say they're, let's say they're, they are still yelling out boring, 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 but it's not as frequent. Okay, so then you, then you sit down with the team or sit down with yourself and go, when, okay, so when are they actually having the most calm times? When are they doing the target behaviors I want to see? And then shift your plan to target that, to be more intense in that targeting that spot. So, for example, had a student that didn't, I'm trying to think of like a really concrete example of this because I know I've got hundreds of them floating around in my head. Um, had a student that didn't want to go to recess all the time. And so they would do these behaviors right before, right before lunchtime. So what I did is I, I identified they didn't want to go to recess, okay, and then it was like we actually shifted their recess time. We told them we were going to shift their recess time to, a, to right after a preferred period. And was so they'd be going outside with different peers as opposed to the peers that they're having. At first, we went through some ups and downs of the plan. At first, it was like, wow, this is really great. They went to recess right away. And then they realized, well, none of my friends that I really want to hang out with are out here. So then it was like, okay. So we adjusted our plan to like, okay, we'll move it. 
we'll still have some, we'll still move it to have something preferred that you like right before recess so you're in a good mood. And then we'll coach you, we'll go outside with you, and we'll help you navigate some of those social challenges. And then eventually, you know, it was basically the same plan. We were just able to kind of tweak it to the target behavior and then back, and then eventually back off so that we can promote that autonomy. So does that make sense? Kind of like, just pay attention to what your target behaviors are. Don't get wrapped up into like the whole laundry list of things. Figure out what behavior is going to specifically target and go from there. And just make sure too that like you get really excited when you do get to fade them off. Like, oh my gosh, like you've made so much progress, so much growth. Like, you know, you're so much more responsible now. We're so excited. We don't need to do this for you anymore. Like it worked. You've got yourself back on track. You know, and like look at you now. This is so amazing. So kind of like try and phrase it that way so they don't feel like they're mm. losing something. It's because they're doing so much better. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it's like we've had we've had situations with kids where like, you know, we'll we'll kind of test the autonomy, right? Like, okay, so we've been giving them this incentive for like like four months here, and I'm all, I, I've noticed the last two times I've given it to them, they have filled their star chart or whatever, and I've had to ask them, hey, star chart's full, like, do you want this thing or not? So then I just stopped doing it, and then like six months go by, hey, Mr. C, I haven't gotten my prize in like six months. <laughs> What's up with that? Well, do you want it? Yeah, I do. Well, how come you didn't ask me for those past four months, dude? Like, come on. You obviously don't want it anymore. You don't need it anymore. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and I'm proud of you. Okay, that's actually a very good thing, all right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that, that sometimes it just happens naturally, and you can be aware of those type of things and keep your eyes on, eyes on it. Um, remember, this is what we were talking about earlier, generalizing across settings, right? So, you, you were the example, you're talking about TV time at home versus at school. Any chance you get a chance to generalize the skill across settings, even if you're rewarding at home, if you're rewarding at school. We have kids that we reward for home and school behavior on the, pre on the next day sometimes we have to when they return to school. So, just, it's okay to build your plan. However, whatever means necessary is going to reinforce that, that positive target behavior and build and, and generalizing it across settings. So, you're teaching those functional skills. Also, I think a lot for like attention seeking behavior, just while we're on this subject, is it's easier to just ignore the problem behavior and just thank every other student around them for doing what they're supposed to be doing and just not giving them any attention. But like, I want to thank this person for like pulling out their book. I want to thank this person. I want to thank this person. I have one student who every time I do that, he goes, you're scamming us. You're just trying to motivate me. <laughs> I'm just like, you are right. That's what I'm doing, but I'm still going to do it. <laughs> right? And so we're in, in, it's okay to talk to them. Like the behavior contracts, you get them involved. They identify what they want to be in, reinforced with. They identify what they want to do to make their life more productive. You talk, you discuss with your classrooms and with these specific students is what's expected behaviors, what's unexpected behaviors, and what the students will do, what, the cop what coping strategies they feel are most effective. You can take those surveys from them. You know, they're always going to, like, this is my favorite thing. All right, what coping strategy do you think is most effective? What do you like to do when you're stressed out? Call of Duty. Okay, you're not doing that at school. What else have you got? Gee, I don't know. Okay, well, what if you like took a five-minute break outside? Like maybe we went in the playground together or something? I guess I could do that. Okay, well, sometimes I don't have the chance to leave. Could you do it on your own? What if I give you a timer to come back five minutes? Is that cool? So you're working with them, getting them involved, getting their buy into some of this stuff, um, getting creative with those expectations, you know, those are the type of things that you, you will benefit you in the long term to be coaching them on. Um, I want to just go back real quick to the unexpected behaviors because expected and unexpected behaviors. This is something that like you can work not if you have a, even if you have a specific student that you're looking at your classroom is like we, we've all had that one student that's like okay this poor you know guy or gal needs more help than most of these other these other folks so I'm gonna like you know really work on this one. It's okay to if you're working on one let's teach the whole class same thing because that way you're teaching them to be functional as well, and you're teaching them that that person's behavior is unexpected, but we know it, we're trying to help them. You know, I, there's nothing wrong with, I've one time, I, I love when a student, like especially if an attention-seeking student, I've, I've, I've done like, hey, you know, I need your help, like you're the principal, man, can you go deliver them this note? And they're like, oh my God, you're asking me to do something really cool, yeah, I'll go deliver the note for you, and the note says like cheese pizza or something, right? <laughs> And the principal's always like, I know you're doing the cheese pizza thing, right? So then I close the door and I'm telling the other kids, hey, look, guys, it's really unexpected when so-and-so calls out and I understand that, okay? When all y'all are raising a quiet hand, that's the expected behavior. We're trying to help him with that. So do me a favor. If he calls out or he tries to get to your attention, we had a, somebody in here that mentioned, like, the, not the attention of the student, the teacher, but of the other students. It's like, so when he does that, don't get sucked in. Guess what? He's trying to get you in trouble, too, all right? Don't do it, okay? We're going to we're gonna help him by not responding to that. 
We're trying to teach him expected behaviors. So we need to have expected behaviors too, guys. Don't do the unexpected thing. And like, you know, you know that you shouldn't be talking to him. You know, you know that something is unexpected. Yeah, we know. So in any way, you're teaching the entire classroom what those expected behaviors are and those unexpected behaviors. Because sometimes they just don't have, the youngsters, they don't have that impulse control. And we got to try to backfill that for them. And that's okay. So it's okay. And then the student comes back to class, you know, okay, cool. And so the, you're, you're getting the momentum going through your classroom. It's okay to coach them on what expected behaviors and unexpected behaviors are. Yes? Well, what we do, we have a group of like four guys that all struggle with similar things. And they all kind of spark it within each other. And then it creates a spiral to the whole group. Mm -hmm. So when it's not just one that's working on it, but they're all working on the same thing, and especially during transition or meeting time, and they'll see each other, and then all of a sudden it just goes off. Um, what would you do when it's like multiple that all have very similar challenges? That's and that's where it gets kind of that's where it gets kind of narrowed and specific. Now, what would you say their similar challenges are? Um, ADHD. Yeah. So they're just kind of getting they're just kind of getting together and they're kind of being silly with each other and like doing that kind of stuff. A lot of loud, like right now or this year, they've done um, their things like really extreme loud laughing mm -hmm. in reaction and response to each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, or to anyone that does any kind of movement or <coughs> facial expression that could be a little bit. Yeah. Um, and their first, second grade, so that's like two graders. So. That age group is, is extremely difficult because you do have like the youngsters. I would definitely, I would, I would, what I would start doing is I would, I would actually start reinforcing the kids who didn't do that yeah. a lot. <laughs> Yeah, um, and also like especially, do you notice it's a specific time that starts happening a little bit more? Like, is there like transition times are really ridiculous? Transition, they're constant, like they're extremely social, mm -hmm. and it's hard to go through any kind of transition to like clean up, up the carpet, change topics. Mm -hmm. That sparks, they just lob up together and then don't hear you. Do right. you review the routine each time? A lot of times we do, or we'll do kind of number one, number two, like two steps yeah. under the carpet a couple of different things to try out. I, I think I would start, like, if you're reinforcing the other kids, you, you, to me, what, what feels like a strategy that I would try first is interrupting that whole cycle interrupting that whole cycle when it happens. So if me, during that routine, I would plant myself right in the middle of that group every day and just be like, hey guys, we're gonna transition together. Come over here, help me with this. You guys are my crew, man. I like you guys, you know what I mean? So try to make it as positive as possible. You don't wanna let them know, like especially that age group, they really respond to that positive, like you're helping me with something. You know, and, the, and, and, and in reality, they are helping you with something. They're helping you stay less stressed so you could run the classroom, you know? <laughs> but they don't need to know that. They used to like, hey, I'm the teacher's buddy now. Like, well, let's, let's, let's work on this together. Hey, man, can you grab your carpet score with me? I'm grabbing my carpet score. Let's go do it. You know, whatever the routine is. I'm just throwing it as a routine. But, like, first step is, like, it's really difficult when you got two or three of them that are in the, the – so I, I tend to just get in the mix with them. You know, the, the, the best way you're going to teach them the functional behavior that you want is by modeling it with them and being right in there. And sometimes kids, especially with ADHD, they need to be right there with you. Mm -hmm. and that's the hardest part. Like, those kids, when they're sitting in that desk, it's so hard to have a kid with ADHD when they're bouncing their desk all the time, and that's so hard for them. So it's like reinforcing them across the room or reinforcing them just by those verbal prompts sometimes isn't enough. You need to be right there, animated, active, positive right there. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's exhausting, but it pays off in droves in the long run. I got saw her hand first, and I'll come back to you. Yeah. One of the other things I do with the kids in my class would be like, go find two things that you're planning on cleaning up and bring to me. I want to see what you found. And then mm. they're like, look what I got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you guys are using that meme with that kid coloring. That always like these type of kids remind me of that kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, reactive strategies. Uh, responding to we're already kind of discussing disruptive behavior, right? They're running around the classroom. Um, use time limits and clear directives. I think we've covered that a lot. Um, identify behaviors that you want the student to exhibit. Um, that comes back to that, that student ready behavior. Um, uh, students complete in this independent assignments outside of class. Um, you can do that. Like sometimes, if you're gonna like, if you're gonna remove a student from class, you can do it very. You can do it in a punitive way. Um, I recommend 
trying to do it in a positive way first, being like, hey, I know you need some space. You know, like, let's get some space to have a functional skill. You need some quiet time. I get that. It's not a, you're not being punished for this thing. We're just trying to give you some time to get back on track, that kind of, those type of strategies. <laughs> Discuss with the student why their behavior was unexpected. Thank you. Yes, some, that's a very good point. Sometimes they don't know why. Some, I've had kids mm -hmm. that don't know that behaviors they're doing are unexpected. And, it's, and it boggles my mind. You sit there and you go, how do you not know that? <laughs> you didn't know, like, peeing on the bathroom floor is something you're not supposed to do? <laughs> I think it kind of goes without saying, right? You know, so sometimes you don't know. So don't miss those opportunities to teach those functional skills. Sometimes it's as simple as like, well, I didn't know that, you know, I don't like Miss Shelby. Why? Because she told me, she gave me feedback that was inappropriate. Well, why, what feedback did she give you? She told me to take out a pencil. <laughs> why is that unexpected? <laughs> Just curious. You're in class, right? It's school. We do the school thing, you know? So never miss those teachable moments, those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Be proactive. We threw a lot of information out at you guys. Yes. I feel very confident in, 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 you, in this group just based on the responses and the, the examples you've given me. Now, I encourage you guys to take this information and make it your own. I don't have a magic wand. I can tell you how behavior plans work. I can tell you this. But if you guys, if you guys don't buy into it and you know your kids better than I do, tr don't be afraid to experiment and try things. Make these plans your own. If they're your own, the kids are going to pick up on that personal touch, and they're going to know that you care about them, and they're going to buy into it even more. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be happy about sometimes you upping the behavioral expectations, but they're going to be more happy if they know that you're on board with them. Make a plan. Identify the problem behavior. Identify the function or purpose. Uh, determine the alternative behaviors you want to see. Develop environmental controls. Create strategy to reinforce all from behaviors, the behavior contracts. Reactive strategies. Be consistent and firm, but fair. Mm -hmm. We use the ruler system. Have you heard of the ruler? Um, and like the mood meters. Yeah, we use a, we use a, a combination of stuff. We have a, whatever resources we have. We, we do, I do like a lot of the Michelle Garcia winter stuff as well. Um, we do the ruler system, uh, pro act training stuff. Uh, of course, a lot of stuff we learned at CHC. We actually, uh, we have you know, our own at EBC. We have our own like school-wide behavior teaching. We call it the behavior te positive behavior teaching system. It's our PBT plan that we have every mm -hmm. kid that's on our school on. So it's managing those behaviors. It's also um, known as a PBIS. I've seen that somewhere too. There you go. Um, you know, positive behavior incentive system, things like that. So um, as far as resources go, that's what we use. Um, I wish I had more for you. Always contact us. I think I think that through our cl community clinic and through our outreach programs and through what we've done, we can definitely provide you with some resource materials and better answers than the one that I just gave you to go <laughs> find some more resources. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, a lot of what you talked about tonight was behaviors. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's what. That's the ruler system that we use. Uh, we are very frequent with that, where it's like identifying yourself on the mood meter and like you're in this quadrant. You know what can you do to get yourself on this quadrant? So we do a lot of that. Um, we at EBC we do like the three different interfaces, which is academic, behavior, and therapeutic. So um, we're behavior and academic, and then that's kind of like a, a therapeutic thing is to identify feelings. But yes, definitely that is a good thing. And there's nothing wrong circling back around with this. Like say you've had a, like a, a situation where a kid has escalated and, and engaged in a non-preferred behavior, right? You know, it, when they're at baseline, that's when their cognition is gonna be the highest, right? So then you can, you can ask them, let's talk about th what happened and have them try to identify through whatever means you guys use with us. Sometimes it's just a simple conversation. Hey, so why did you, wh 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 this, this, this situation happened, and I'd like to avoid, help you avoid doing this in the, in the future. So what were you feeling at that moment? Like, what happened? Well, I was really sad because of blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, can you, do you feel comfortable talking to me about that a little bit? Well, yeah, I just don't like, yeah. and, and so then you get the ball rolling to help them identify those emotions. And then, then you can say, you actually approach that from a behavior perspective too. Next time you're feeling this, why don't you check in with me? That way we can, we can pick a coping strategy or pick something that you would like to do instead of doing engaging in this behavior. Um, so you're teaching, again, you're teaching, that, that is a functional skill, you're teaching them to identify those emotions. So yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's an important component as well. You gotta be very careful, and this is kind of how, my philosophy and how I conduct my job and how I interact with people, you know, like Shelby and I get along and things like that. It's not just behavioral teaching and therapeutic. 
Okay, if it was that simple, we could put all those things in those those three boxes, it'd be easier. But it's more like behavioral teaching therapeutic. It's like mm -hmm. they all run together. Mm -hmm. There's there's some overlap at those seams that we have to be respectful of and figure out how to work with each other in the different disciplines on that. So like we had to talk about examples all night long about how the academic component can bleed into the behavioral component. And the same thing goes through the therapeutic component. They could have these emotional things, struggles that lead to these behavioral issues. Yeah. From what you see and from the work you're doing with different teachers, is, it, is there a, an increase, do you think, in overall in more challenging behavior in school? Or is it just we're looking at it differently now? Um, I think we are looking at it differently now. Um, however, as far as like the, the real meat of the question, I think it's, I think I'll be a disappointing answer because, you know, I, I, I work at a school where we're, this is all we get. So. Yeah, I've been around a lot of other teachers too. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we see the same challenges and I do think we're starting to look at these challenges from different perspectives. And I think that's a positive thing mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I remember back when I was in school, it was just like, oh, you've got this problem, go over to that classroom. And it was, it, there was no real work to identify why I had certain academic or emotional struggles. And uh, I really think that we've gone, gone a couple steps in the right direction of trying to identify some of these issues a little bit earlier. I can tell you from a perspective that it's, it's easier to help a family and a student when you're dealing with replacing a functionally equivalent replacement behavior with something that's been reinforced for five years than you are 15 years. So the earlier we can have the intervention, the more likely we're going to get positive outcomes. Yeah. Um, I think one of the hard things for me is to come up with plans to intervene with kids who aren't so much behaving badly as just not behaving at all. Mm -hmm. so like either mm, not shut down kids. Work or shut down kids. So there, there's one child um, who, when given correction on a task or a behavior, will melt down mm -hmm. into like a long crying lapse but become like unresponsive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How to like what kinds of things to do when there's no like there's not an interaction? There's, I mean, there is an interaction, but it's all coming from one direction. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that those are more challenging. I'd rather have a kid throw something at me than <laughs> shut down. Um, but I think for those, we usually use incentive plans, and it's you know, if you are able to just like say one word or put the break card on my desk we you know like usually if they just take space hopefully they can come back and actually like process what they're feeling um sometimes they shut down because they're like you know they're feeling uncomfortable but they're not really able to identify why they're feeling that way um and if they're not even able to say like hey i just need a break right now just give them a break card and as long as they just like set it on their desk they, they can walk out of the room for five minutes mm -hmm. um and then just each time they do that like give them a little reward like a piece of candy or something like that was amazing like you know you like you took a break mm -hmm. uh, you know maybe now we can process this and if they're responding if they're responding that way to the shutdown to like for example when you're trying to correct something like that's where the looking for the positive really benefits, and you're gonna. It's like you got to overload the other side, and it's yeah. gonna feel unnatural at first, right? It's like, it's like, like if you're grading an assignment, be like, dude, problems one through two were awesome, man. Mm -hmm. Like you did one through two, dude, you slayed it. All right, <laughs> like one through two were really cool. Now I'd like to teach you how to do two through four the same way you did one through two, because that was awesome. Like one through two, total catch yeah. pajamas, man. Yeah. I'm gonna give you like whatever for one through two, you know what I mean? So it seems unnatural, but like you're trying to stop them from getting into that self-deprecating, that, that yeah, negative cycle, spiraling. you know? Um, I'd be curious yeah. to know more about that. <laughs> those ones are, they're a little bit more, those, those inner behaviors are a little bit more difficult to target where they're coming from, what the antecedents are, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, guys. You were fun to hang yes, out with. Thank you for coming.